Today, I'm joined by Arsen Ostrovsky, who's a leading Israel-based international human rights lawyer and CEO of the International Legal Forum. He's spoken at the United Nations, the British Parliament here, and around the world, uh, in every case, making the case for Israel. So Arsen, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Cheers. Thanks, man. Good to be here with you. So, Arsene, I'm, I'm going to we're going to be taking um, attack of international law through through this uh, through this crisis. Uh, but first of all, before we get into that technical stuff, um, you know, people since the beginning of the war, people have asked us in the diaspora, <clears throat> do you have any family there who are affected? And sometimes you feel like saying, yeah, we have nine million of them. Um, and you're one of those. Uh, what's it like right now? Give me a snapshot of how people are feeling what's the latest on the the news and the war and what's what's you know it's it's the 21st of november it's tuesday it's the what 40 something day of the war what's what are things like today so look i think first of all i should say you now when you talk about the sort of the sense of family um it's reciprocal as well because even when we're here in israel and still under the incessant threat of rocket fire and terror attacks we're also not oblivious to what is happening in the diaspora. We see the marches in London. We see the attacks on synagogues um, in America, the violence, uh, the vitriol, the hatred against against Jews. So, um, you know, we're not oblivious to that as well. And as you said, you know, we are one, you know, we're one big mishpacha. We are one big family. And what affects a Jew anywhere ought to affect Jews everywhere. And certainly Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people has that obligation as well so certainly those uh, images that we see happening uh, from the um, um you know from the streets of europe and north america and elsewhere uh, do resonate um as well so i should say that's important um look in terms of on the ground um you know there's an immediate sort of eerie sense of i don't want to say calm um the intensity in the rockets has fallen uh, that's as expected because obviously the Israeli uh, ground forces are well within uh, within Gaza now, um, albeit we do have periodic uh, rocket fire still. Um, but the main priority really now is the hostages. Um, that's really uh, the focus uh, of all of us here. Um, there is, um, you know, it's, it's this collective sense of grief and anguish and torment and torture when we see our loved ones you know this is israel is a small country it's a very small country it's even smaller now everyone knows someone either someone directly family a loved one who was either killed or kidnapped um those who are serving in gaza now we're waiting to hear back from them you know are they okay um are they are they back um you know, it's when we see these images of uh, our children, our, you know, that there could be anyone's children, daughters, sons, brothers, fathers. Um, so it is very personal. And I think that at the moment is the number one priority for us. Uh, we know that the, the soldiers will do whatever needs to be done. Um, that we have no doubt. But really, the, the primary focus right now is on getting the hostages back. Right, and there's been a lot of talk of a of a deal uh, recent, uh, recently over the past few days. It seems to me like a lot of the leaks have been coming from the Qataris, uh, and it, I, I wonder whether part of it is the psychological manipulation of the Israeli public and the families. Um, you know, we've seen the uh, Hamas saying that they're unwilling to release two, the, a whole family from captivity, only one member. At, you know, uh, and keeping others in captivity to keep the psychological pressure on those families to help divide Israeli society. Um, what's before we get into the international law situation? What, what's your reading of of what we can expect in the coming days? Well, first of all, I don't think we should expect anything until it happens. Uh, there is so much misinformation, disinformation, and as you say, a lot of uh, psychological warfare and mind games being played. You know, the fact that they're even talking about splitting apart families. Um, in order to perpetuate this ongoing torch. I mean, that in itself is a war crime. Um, you know, this is who we're dealing with. Hamas is not a rational actor. You know, this is a brutal jihadist terror group that doesn't abide by any uh, norms or rules. And quite frankly, when we're talking about Qataris, the Qataris are not, this, the Qataris are not Mother Teresa. Uh, we have to remember that they're not some humanitarian angel. We have to remember that Qataris are one of the, along with Iran, one of the primary funders of Hamas. They are the ones that are providing a safe haven and a base for people like Khaled Mashal and others in the Hamas leadership to work and operate and plan and execute out of Doha 
Um, so Qataris are not doing this out of any altruistic purposes. They're doing this in order to continue uh, this ongoing um, psychological uh, trauma and, quite frankly, um, using these tactics in order to uh, placate Hamas and in order to uh, essentially give them a lifeline. Because for every pause we have in the fighting, that is a pause in which allows Hamas to rearm, move, recalibrate and continue further attacks. Um, so if the Qataris actually had any uh, real interest, um, and certainly our friends in the US, the UK, elsewhere, can put pressure on them to release all the hostages and to um, disassociate themselves uh, from uh, Hamas. Yeah, and, and we've seen that in the, one of the demands, for example, in the hostage negotiations from Hamas has been that where if and when there is a ceasefire, the Israelis have got to agree not to spy from, from the air during that period. I mean, there's only one reason why they want that to be the case. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, I mean, veering into the international law area now, it's been really quite striking to me how the, the, the two words, war crimes, have been successfully attached to Israel in the mind of the public ar ar across the West, rather than Hamas, when it's been quite obvious that there's, at, le at the very least, a dispute as to whether Israel's guilty of war crimes. But there's no dispute as to whether Hamas is guilty of war crimes. And indeed, the Qataris are aiding and abetting and funding those war crimes. Um, what, what do you think about that? You know, there's... You know, there's a common presumption of innocence until proven guilty in most Western legal systems and democracies. Uh, but when it comes to Israel, it's the complete inverse. It's we're guilty until proven innocent. And in most cases, whether it's at the UN bodies or in some parts of the media, um, we're guilty from the start uh, and nothing we can do will ever prove our innocence. I mean, the fact that we still have to prove that, yes, babies were decapitated or that, yes, women were raped. I mean, that is preposterous. Um, Israel is the only country that has to actually explain that. Um, and this this is, uh, this is what we're... Uh, what we're dealing with. Um, you know, we're fighting this war on multiple battlefronts. It's not only on the ground in Gaza. We're fighting in the legal arena, certainly. We're fighting in the diplomatic arena. Uh, we're fighting in the public arena, on social uh, media, in the mainstream press, as obviously you know very well as well, which we've seen some of the some of the reporting, which we also need to uh, bear in mind that even reporters who um, create narratives who initiate these discussions, um, they contribute, they aid and abet, whether it's um, freelancers who are embedded with uh, Hamas, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, news media like the BBC who refuse to even call out Hamas as a terrorist organisation um, or talk about, you know, resistance or militants, um, that facilitates the very perverse discussion that we are having and that ultimately plays into the hands of what you're seeing unfold on the streets with the mass um, protests against Israel. Um, now, at the end of the day, we need to bear in mind that, you know, I will stand up in any court of law, in any public, any day of the week, twice on Shabbat, and proudly defend the State of Israel because I'm 100% confident that the State of Israel has not committed any war crimes. The party here that is guilty is Hamas, and what they're guilty is essentially of a triple war crime of shooting indiscriminately and targeting, massacring Israeli civilians whilst using their own people as human shields with the ultimate goal of the destruction of the Jewish state, which is tantamount to genocide. This is a triple war crime that the Hamas is guilty of. And as long as the West excuses, justifies, legitimizes, or even worse, contextualizes these actions, um, they only aid, abet, and facilitate uh, the violence that we're seeing. Right. So, I mean, so that's really interesting, I think, for listeners. So there are three distinct war crimes at the founder. I mean, there are, there are more than that. Though. Oh, no, there, there, are, there are many um, more. But the three fundamental ones that underpin Hamas's position are, number one, attacking civilians, I, mean, I say attacking, but you know what I mean? That's an understatement. Um, number two, the use of human shields. And number three, seeking to destroy a nation state. Is that what you're saying? 
Correct. Um, look, there are many more. Look, every conceivable international law that exists, Hamas has violated it beyond a recognition. Um, and it's not just what I just said now. We're also talking about rape is a war crime, pillaging is a war crime, mutilating bodies as they've done is a war crime. And it so goes on and on and on. I'm using civilian shields, taking hostages, these are all war crimes. And ultimately under the, you know, what is of the international legal system, you have a really a closed case here of uh, Hamas being guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Uh, but I would add to that, that it's not only, it's Hamas first and foremost, who are guilty of because they are the ones that carry out and perpetrated these heinous actions. Then you also have the Palestinian Authority, which has legal responsibility jurisdiction, including under the ICC for the territory of Gaza. You have the Iranians who are funding, instructing, supporting these actions. And then and on top of that, the Qataris. Um, you then can also ask other questions in terms of what is the Red Cross, the UN, all these agencies, you know, did they turn their backs as a, uh, the Hamas terrorists were turning Shifa Hospital into their terrorist headquarters. You know, what role did they have to play? Right, um, right. So complicity seems to be stretching quite far and wide um, uh, at the moment. Um, so let's turn to the Israeli side now. So if you can just run me through, I mean, I think this this material is really valuable to have clarity for, for our listeners. Run me through the, the principal charges that, that Israel is is um, is facing, and why they do not apply. Um, how long do we have on this uh, <laughs> on, on this program? <laughs> um, let's take another few minutes. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, it, it seems. Uh, you know, Golda Meir famously said, um, "You know, the world hates a Jew who hits back. The world loves to pity. Uh, the loves only to." pity us people love uh, their jews correct that's um, you know the stark unfortunate a reality um you know we see you know everyone just about everyone in you know in the, in the reasonable sense including in europe will say absolutely israel has a right to self-defense but then when we actually exercise that right to self-defense let's say oh hold on war crime. hold on uh, um it's a war crime, uh, proportionality, you name it, and all of these charges and then ultimately being used to castigate and vilify us. And then we see them, this kind of perverse uh, discourse playing out and amplifying and emboldening and empowering uh, the anti-Semites on the street who then go out and march and call for intifada, jihad, shoot at um, synagogues and Jewish community centers as well. Um, look, I think that the primary charge is always um, whenever Israel fights back is that uh, we're somehow guilty of acting disproportionately. You know, it is this perverse Orwellian charge that is only ever made at Israel because heaven forbid the Jewish state refuses to surrender and allow its citizens to be slaughtered. Right. You know, what, and I would always, you know, I always answer to that, well, what is proportionate? What is a proportional response when you just had 40 babies who were massacred? What is a proportionate response to mass rape? Do you honestly expect it would be proportionate for Israel to go to Gaza and do the same? Of course not. Let's answer that question. What So legally, what is a proportionate response to those atrocities? Legally, it's, it's very simple. You know, under international law, uh, proportionality is defined by um, what might be the anticipated um uh, harm to civilians in light of the military objective by which you're seeking to pursue. Now, we know that in the fog of war, there will always regrettably be civilians who are harmed. The difference is, whereas Israel does everything possible to minimize civilian casualties, Hamas does everything possible to maximize civilian casualties. On both sides. But the, on, on both sides, 100%. But the issue here is, you know, Israel has a very clear military objective to eliminate Hamas, a jihadist organization openly sworn to the destruction of the state of Israel. Right. That is legitimate, legal, and just. Now, it doesn't mean that Israel can do whatever it wants. Um, Israel still needs to abide by principles, for example, of distinction, which we do because we aim only at Hamas targets. Mm. Um, we need to provide adequate warning. Are which there any Israel does. Are there any examples like you know, in terms of the precedent, legal precedent? 
of cases of proportionality that come to mind from previous conflicts that have been used in war crime tribunals with regard to proportionality? No, there's there's nothing of I think uh, analogous uh, to this. Um, you know, you you can ask, well, you know, what did you know what did Churchill do in World War Two uh, with Dresden? Um, would you call him a war criminal for helping defeat the Nazis? Of course not. What but about Dresden, America? But, but, but Dresden was a very controversial. It is it's grown in controversy since the war, but even at the time. Some people, particularly bishops in the House of Lords, were speaking out against it. So I found that when I cite I, in my debates that I've had, when I mention Dresden, I'm not saying that Dresden was OK. But the response is always, well, if you're saying, are you saying that Israel is fine because we firebombed 25,000 people, therefore Israel should be allowed to do the same? Are you saying that because we invaded Iraq, Israel should be allowed to level Gaza? That's the response. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered whether... You know, were there were any kind of real world examples of, you know, in your experience, in your mind, from whether from Mosul or from uh, other conflicts that we've had, where we were seen to be completely in the right, and civilians were killed as part of a military objective, uh, and nobody took a placard onto the streets that are useful for people to know about when they're engaging with people in, in this sort of debate. I mean, look, I honestly don't know of any other. Um or military conflict in modern times um, that has gone to the extent that Israel has, not just to meet its obligations, but to go above and beyond. Israel has given here, literally, they've dropped millions of leaflets. They have called um, Gazan civilians. They've given them a safe passage. Uh, they have, they're providing, uh, facilitating humanitarian aid. I don't recall... Um, the British troops doing that when you're in Afghanistan, or the the Americans uh, in in Iraq as well in, in in recent times. No one goes to that extent, and ultimately also, by the way, to the detriment and risk to Israel's own soldiers. And they put them in the line of fire at risk in order to avoid casualties with them um, with the Palestinians. You know, Israel doesn't have to provide, for example, uh, fuel or electricity. Um, because these are essential services which Hamas then uses to, uh, in order to uh, power their terrorist infrastructure, their tunnels, their, their rockets. You know, they talk about lack of fuel, but yesterday Hamas fired or rained down dozens and dozens of rockets. They seem to have plenty of fuel uh, for that, plenty of fuel for their uh, uh, for their tunnels, um, and they are siphoning these essential supplies. Notwithstanding, Israel is still going out of its way to facilitate humanitarian aid to provide these warnings to provide safe passages going really above and beyond um really what is required and ultimately at risk to their own soldiers as well right and and we're still talking about into about proportionality one detail i just wanted to to ask you about was I, i've seen in a couple of places the uh, i the concept of civilian to combatant ratio death ratio mm -hmm. um and i've seen um, it, it claims that Israel has a track record of a better civilian to combatant ratio, as in, um, you know, that the number of civilians killed per combatant, as it were, better than that of Britain and the United States. I, is that true? Um, I've certainly heard of that, um, so it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, but that's, you know, and that's something that I believe has been... Uh, um, pattern uh with all israeli operations you know we you know israel doesn't want war um this is something that has been thrust and upon upon israel and now left with no choice but to fight you know what was on october 6th cannot be now again um and when people call for a ceasefire you know you have to remember there was a ceasefire on october 6th and when you look at these images of bloodied children's beds when you look at the burnt bodies with someone with their hands still tied, and you think this is who you want to have a ceasefire with? You know, we we, we mentioned Churchill before, and um, you know, I recall uh, as I'm as I'm sure you would, uh, being uh, an astute history student, you know, in his uh, the blood uh, blood sweat tears and toil speech, you know, his first as um as prime minister in the House of Commons, you know, when he spoke about what is what is your aim defeating the Nazis, he said in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory, however long and how the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. This applies here to Israel because yeah. we cannot live with a ISIS Nazi-like 
enemy like Hamas. And by the way, the only difference between um, uh, between the Hamas and Nazis, there's no difference in terms of their monstrous evil and their agenda and their barbaric methods. The only difference is the Nazis in some way sought to cover uh, their heinous actions, whereas we saw with Hamas using GoPros and live streaming this, um, and they're still playing this sort of perverse, torturous, psychological uh, game, which in itself is, by the way, um, another war crime. Right, right. And it seems to me that, I mean, the, one one very vivid example is is when we fought ISIS, Islamic State, in Mosul 2016-17, when the RAF and the Americans bombed it. We besieged it, bombed it. Uh, ISIS were embedded within the civilian population. The Iraqis and the Kurds went in, and by the end, about 11,000 civilians were killed. They didn't have any less gruesome a death than the Gazan civilians who were being, who were being killed in this conflict, and yet not a single person raised their voice in objection at the time. Um, so that's proportionality. Um, what other print, uh, other sort of crimes, uh, me, sort of main, the main charges that Israel is facing that you think are totally, um, totally wrong? I mean, we're, we're talking a lot now also about um, what's happening in the hospitals of Gaza. Yeah. Now, um, you know, you, you can't be human and not look at these scenes and see the children and not feel on the one sense empathy for what is happening to them because it is tragedy. But also this sense of uh, outrage, the fact that Hamas would be putting them in this situation. Now under international law, hospitals, but the civilian insides, such as hospitals as well, um, the sacrosanct, you do not target them. There is one, one sole exception, because international humanitarian law does offer some kind of pragmatism recognition and uh, uh, in times of war, uh, there are possibilities in which these kinds of sites do become legitimate military targets. And that happens when terror groups like Hamas hijack them for military purposes, when they turn them into command and control centers, as we've seen beyond any irrefutable doubt, as they've done with Shifa Hospital. We saw the videos just yesterday of the Hamas terrorists taking hostages in there. And we know that they killed one of the hostages, Noah Marciano, a 19-year-old girl, after she was taken hostage in the hospital. We've seen the tunnels, the shafts. We've seen them firing rockets and RPGs. And now that is in itself a heinous war crime that the Hamas would use these uh, you know, holy, sacred <laughs> sites such as hospitals and turn them into their own headquarters. Now, that does open them up as legitimate military targets. It doesn't give Israel carte blanche uh, to, um, you know, to destroy them because we are still talking about civilians there as well. Um, and in order for Israel to undertake any kind of military action, you still have to bear in mind providing warning to the civilians and innocent people there and that those warnings do not go unheeded. Now, Israel has repeatedly, including the Shifa Hospital, for a matter of weeks, have provided warnings for them to evacuate, have offered safe passage. We still have to abide by the principles of distinction and proportionality, which, again, is has been discharged here because we know that Israel is only targeting Hamas targets. Um, so, and this is something that, you know, as I said, you know, it's not just a legal fight, you're also fighting optics and narratives and you know you're seeing these hospital images and it's it's very easy to be outraged but we need to put this in context understand that why this is the situation that it is it is there only because the masters turn them into their command centers for the purposes of attacking israel yeah so if there's a war crime happening in the hospitals it's been perpetrated by hamas Absolutely. Hamas has turned them into military sites um, and they've committed other gross crimes there from, um, uh, you know, from uh, executing hostages who were taken there. Um, and you have to also remember that even with Shifa Hospital, which is the hospital in Gaza, you know, you, you might have seen the images of um, it was a Thai and a Nepalese man, both hostages taken from Israel, being dragged, physically being being dragged. And then, of course, you have some of your usual suspects claiming, oh, but, you know, look at the humanitarian Hamas, where they're giving them treatment. They're not giving them treatment. You, first of all, you see them dragging them in physically against their will. But you also have to bear in mind that when you're making your way from Israel to Shifa Hospital, 
Shifa Hospital is not the first hospital on your stopping list. There's at least 10 other hospitals along the way. So you have to also wonder, well, why are they going there? And they're going there because they control Shifa, because they control the doctors. And you also have to wonder, you know, even you look in the videos and you, you, you have to ask, you know, you literally you see doctors in their, um, you know, in their uniforms standing there and facilitating this. What did they know? And not only the doctors, but what did the West know? What did the International Committee of the Red Cross know? What did the WHO no, are they complicit in uh, in these crimes as well? Those are answers that need to be uh, need to be found. I mean, in, in fact, that particular uh, bit of footage with them dragging the hostages in, the most shameful and egregious moment for me of that whole sort of depraved episode was when people were tweeting, particularly Owen Jones and with his million followers in the UK, tweeted that you know what's the big deal? They were taking them in to get humanitarian to, to get um, medical. Uh, help why are you complaining about it and in the video you can see that one of the men dragging them in was holding a meat cleaver yeah now what's he going to do an operation i mean it was just so it was so clear it was so obvious um yeah, and the look, more I don't think there's, any difference, there's any difference between um these kinds of people and the ones uh, we've seen that now um you know whether questioning whether babies were decapitated as if it's somehow less evil that they were decapitated or that they were uh, burned to death. I mean, this is kind of depraved logic. And now we're seeing this, what's uh, the only way to explain is this kind of mass rape denial that yeah. somehow the rape of Isra mass rape and mutilation of Israeli girls, first of all, by the way, and women is somehow less than rape, is somehow being contextualized i mean this is the kind of perverse uh and the baby i mean the baby thing was particularly awful as well i remember at the time there was there was one commentator who was trying to say when they, everyone was saying oh the babies weren't beheaded actually making the argument that they had their throats slit but they weren't actually fully beheaded i mean as it, i mean what the the sort of the moral depths of of, of um as i say of depravity are just beyond beyond any expectation um, or, or, or um, beyond belief, really. Um, anyway, so we've got, so you talked about proportionality. We've talked about the use of hospitals, um, both of which war crimes perpetrated by Hamas, and yet Israel is blamed for trying to respond to them as humanely as it can. Is there a third one that you can give us, a, th a third charge that's laid at Israel's door totally unfairly? Um, look, I can give you... <laughs> Look, every charge that the, our detractors can use against Israel, they use that because they understand they're also fighting this war of this war of narratives, trying to castigate and, and vilify Israel. But I think it's imperative here that um, we, you know, maintain the focus on the actual crimes that are being committed. Those crimes by Hamas, right. whether it's, this, whether it's uh, using uh, human shields, you know, even uh, Prime Minister Sunak. Um, said in the you know in the weeks after that they he actually said you know they they hide behind Palest they they fire at Israeli at Israelis and then go hide behind Palestinian children. So the UK has been and James Cleverly when he was foreign minister until just recently been very, very clear about this. Um and I know that's been certainly appreciated in Israel. Uh, but I think it's imperative that we maintain the focus on the crimes being committed by the Hamas, which are I mean literally every crime you can possibly imagine has been committed and you know, we started talking about the the hostages, and I think you know, and talking about something it's important with reference to the hostages because, you know, even that in itself is a major war crime. You know, people are talking about them as if they're prisoners of war. These are not prisoners of war. The youngest hostage is a ten month old baby. He was nine months when they kidnapped him. You have siblings um, who were Ella and Daphna. Ziv, who were like, I think, 8 and 15, who were taken out of their bed and were still wearing their pyjamas, but not before seeing, as I understand, their father being executed before their eyes. You have a pregnant woman who reportedly gave birth. You know, what sort of, it's not just monstrous evil, what sort of cowardice takes a 35-week pregnant woman as a hostage? Elderly, you have 40 children. Um, you have um, grandmothers, Holocaust survivors, uh, a woman who was literally taken from her wheelchair, they are now languishing in what can only be described as the dungeons of 
Gaza, underneath uh, the underneath Gaza. So you know the taking of hostages first and foremost is a major war crime. It's a crime against humanity under international humanitarian law, under the Rome Statute, under the Geneva Conventions. Um, but even when you take hostages, there is some element of um, I don't want to say some kind of rules, but it's sort of this very twisted way of describing it. But some kind of rules of providing proof of life of um, providing medical assistance none of that is happening here and then you also have to you know and we know we've spoken about how they're using the hostages also as this perverse psychological warfare then you have to ask well where the hell is the red cross yeah well let's i mean that's just the uh, i know you haven't got very long you've got to go and catch a plane to the states you're coming to us from from uh, tel aviv by the way in case listeners wanted to know that um so you haven't got very long, but I wanted to uh, just to ask you about international bodies, particularly the UN and the Red Cross and others. Um, you know, you, you've moved in these circles for years. You know what they're like. The UN in particular, as we know, is is that the majority of members of the UN are not democracies, um, by the way, which also I think has a bearing on it. Um, what's your feeling about uh, their the levels of objectivity that you find there and the way in which it plays into what we're seeing unfolding on the ground? Um, you know, I think um, the way we've seen the UN's actions uh, in the wake of this, uh, the UN has absolutely zero credibility. And I remember the famous words of uh, David Ben-Gurion, he was first prime minister, Um Shmum. Um, you know, he said, he said that back how many years ago now? And I think that uh, resonates very strongly now. You know, when Antonio Guterres, the head of this world body, says, well, we have to look at the Hamas crimes. You know, you can't look at, you have, you have to look at them in, in context, or I think in his exact words, uh, those in, in a vacuum. You can't look at them in a vacuum. I'm like, are you trying to honestly say that there is some kind of context for the atrocities which they perpetrated? When we have seen mass rape and mutilation of women, and you have to ask, where is the UN Women's Agency? when we see 40 something children who were massacred, murdered, butchered, even more than that, I think. And now you're seeing another 30, 40 that are being held hostage in Gaza. And you have to ask, where is UNICEF? When we're talking about the Red Cross, you know, the Red Cross failed the Jewish people in the Holocaust. They're failing us again now. This is an organization that prides itself on being, you know, unwaveringly neutral. When it comes to the Jewish people, they are unwaveringly absent. Not a single proof of life, not a single visit, not a single thing they can say about any of the hostages. And yes, they've condemned it. Yes, they call for their release. But with all due respect, politely calling for their release, that's not enough. You have to demand it. Your own mandate obliges you, requires you to do that. And if you can't do that, what sort of message does that send? That the Jewish lives are worthless? What message does it send to other terrorist groups who can then replicate what Hamas is doing? So as far as I'm concerned, you know, these agencies who for years, they knew what was happening in Shifa Hospital. It's impossible, you know, when MRI, MRI stations are packed with Kalashnikovs, when you have these tunnels, when you have the uh, Hamas coming in and out, where were they? This was happening under their nose. So as far as I think I'm concerned, not only morally, politically, but legally, um, the international community, the UN agencies, the Red Crosses of the world are aiding, abetting and complicit in the ongoing um, heinous crimes that we're seeing perpetrated against Israel. Wow, okay. Um, so, Arsene, I know you've got to go. So there's one further question, just finally, I wanted to ask you if that's okay. Uh, it's a bit more general about 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 you and how you, how you work. Um, you know, you're an international lawyer, uh, a working international lawyer you're also one of the world's most prominent pro-israel activists um and a source of inspiration to many um i was just wondering how the two things go together do people cast aspersions on your on your objectivity because you campaign so hard in favor of israel and how do you deal with that um, look, people always uh, cast dispersions, uh, you know, I think as the saying goes, you have enemies good, that means you uh, you stood for something, and um, that's the way I look at it, um, you know, I'm a lawyer, uh, but first and foremost, I'm a father, you know, I have two small children as well, you know, I've had to run in and out, I've written articles and done interviews inside bomb shelters, 
um, never in a million years that I think I would be doing that. Um, you know, I have to look at my six and a half year old daughter uh, when we come out of the bomb shelter and answer her when she asks me, Abba, why are they doing this? Why don't they like us? You know, I have to answer a six and a half year old who looks at you with those puppy eyes or when you in the middle of the night. Well, what do you say to that question? So, um, that's probably what I should say. Um, you know, I, I say that there are people in this world who don't like us. And that's unfortunate reality. Um, you know, you, you want your, your duty as a father, first and foremost, is to shield your children, uh, to protect them. Um, when a siren goes off and you're away from them, it's that sheer helplessness uh, of not, not knowing also. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm 100% beyond any doubt, know that, you know, not only do we have the law behind us, but our cause is just and it's moral that, yes, we are a liberal democracy. Yes, we are fighting against a ruthless enemy that doesn't abide by any rules. But notwithstanding, we still do whatever we can in order to achieve peace. This is not a war that Israel wanted, but this is a war which we are forced to fight and we will win. Yeah, and as I, as I often say, Arsene, uh, the advantage that you and I have on our side of the argument is that we, is that we happen to be right. That helps. Okay, Arsene, I'll let you catch your plane. Thank you so much for making time for us, and I hope you'll join us again.